Cloud 3. Hey everyone, Dr. Tim and Hillary for our 20th podcast of Dr. Tim's Aquatics. And it's a Q&A session. We always get lots of questions and um, we've got a full, maybe we're going to have to split this into two parts. We'll see. But how are you doing this morning, Hillary? I'm doing good. I'm excited that it's our 20th podcast. Yeah. And lots of subscribers, uh, which is great. We appreciate the support, everyone. Yes. I've actually got a question today on our list from somebody in the UK. So I'm excited to see that this is uh, being listened to worldwide. Okay. I promise not to answer it in my British accent, which doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's, let's get started. All right. So first question on the list is what is the difference between the one and only for saltwater and the one and only for reef and nano aquariums? Oh, we get an easy one right off the bat. So they are exactly the same. This is our saltwater mix of nitrifying bacteria, and it's just for branding. There are some stores and customers that want a saltwater product. So we have a saltwater line. Other stores or regions in the country, Florida, for uh, instance, or California, have just reef-specific stores. You, you see that in names, and they will only carry reef-labeled items. So we make a reef line, but inside, both the same, always uh, bacteria, good for any type of saltwater reef, uh, seahorse, just if it's got any salt in it, use either one doesn't matter they're interchangeable good to know good to know all right question number two i've been battling a nasty whitish light brown mucousy stringy substance which i believe is bacteria in my tank it takes over and covers almost all of the sand and the white wispy strands are all over the rock i've purchased dr tim's refresh for reef tanks and waste away but i don't know the exact instruction for dosing each and win. Okay, well, the good news is we have this written down. We have a set of recipe cards, which you can download at our uh, site, drtimsaquatics.com, or you can email us and we'll send you a PDF. And it tells you day by day, what product to use, how much, and everything. So initially, though, uh, you want to use the refresh. And so we recommend, because it's a numbers game, you've got to get the refresh bacteria to overwhelm the bacterial biofilm that you're seeing. So first off, try to physically remove by siphoning as much as you can of that bacteria out, and then immediately apply the refresh to the tank. And now, depending, we like to start at a full dose, but depending if you've never used refresh or if you have shrimp or um, uh, snails in the tank, you have to be careful because for some reason we don't quite understand uh, the refresh can negatively impact shrimp and snails, especially if it's a bare bottom type tank. Um, but the more you can add up to the recommended dose, the better, because you hit the bacteria biofilm hard. Uh, you wait a day and you hit it again with the refresh. You wait another day and you hit it again with the refresh. So it's two or three days with a day in between of refresh dosing to really knock the bacteria back. But then you start with the waste away. And this, you definitely want to start at a quarter dose or even smaller, because as I've said many times, the waste away bacteria are going to degrade. They grow on all this dead organic material, and you don't, we don't know how much you have. It's always easier to add a little bit more than have to deal with uh, bacterial bloom. So uh, between refresh and waste away, you can siphon clean again as much material out is, is in the tank to get the organics out and then start with no more than a quarter dose of the waste away in the tank. If the water gets cloudy, don't add more until the cloudiness goes away. Be very careful 
with just pouring it in. Please pay attention to the instructions. It's one ounce per 30 gallon of the waste away. So do the math. Um, and you can siphon clean in between waste away doses. What we recommend if the water's not cloudy is again, dose, wait a day, dose again, upping the dose a little bit more. It is a process. The white stringy stuff didn't appear you know, overnight, though it may seem like that, but there you've You've got a, a lot of organics in the tank. You've got a lot of nutrients. So it took time to build that up. It's going to take time to get rid of this. And uh, perseverance helps keeping the tank clean. Maybe uh, consider how deep your substrate is. Really don't want to do any more than about an inch and a half or so. Deep, deep sand beds, deep substrate beds are always going to be a problem because they trap organics and you've got to really get it in there and clean them. Um, so that's the general instructions. As I said, you can get the specific day by day, step by step at our website. Yep. Or if you have trouble finding it on the website, just send us a message. We are happy to send you a PDF of this. Right. And it's always a follow up on there is like, what do I do with the protein skimmer? So because the protein skimmer does remove bacteria, you want to turn the skimmer off, but if you've never used either product with your aquarium, don't just turn it off and walk away and forget about it. Uh, turn it off for maybe a couple hours at the most, but if the water starts to turn cloudy at all, turn the skimmer back on because that's an indication of a bacterial bloom and you don't want the bloom to continue or grow because it can remove uh, oxygen, which can harm the inhabitants of the tank. So uh, you just need to be looking. If you're treating your tank, so you just can't treat and walk away from it. You need to be paying attention and monitoring what you're doing. Yes. And like we talked about this on planning for vacations and going away or emergencies. Don't ever dose anything when you know you're not going to be there the next day. Yep. So, and small... Frequent dosing is much better than just pouring a bunch in the tank. Yep. All right, moving on. Question number three. I added a waste away gel to my 20 gallon tank and after 36 hours, the water got cloudy. My tank is two months old. It's got three fish and a few corals. I thought it was gonna help bring down the phosphates and the nitrates. I don't have a protein skimmer just to filter with two power heads. Do you know why this isn't working and what's causing the water to be cloudy? Okay. Well, there's several parts to this uh, question. So several answers. First, the cloudy water. Well, we just talked about that. The waste away bacteria, the gel is releasing bacteria into the system. Uh, they have found food, nitrate, phosphate, organics, and they're consuming those, mineralizing and breaking down those organics which is producing more food for the bacteria, at least temporarily. And so you've got a bacterial bloom. The cloudy water is the bacteria growing and growing and growing. So on one hand, that's a good sign because it tells you that the bacteria are working and getting rid of those nutrients. Now, the problem with this setup is you don't have a skimmer. So you don't have any way of getting rid of the bacteria. So the bacteria are changing the organics and the nitrate and phosphate into bacteria. You know, they're incorporating or simulating those. But once they run out of food, they will die back too and basically recirculate those nutrients back into the system. <laughs> Excuse me. So what you need to do is... Since you don't have a skimmer, recommend getting a small filter of a micron filter back, or de I mean, depending on what your filtration is, a finer sponge, you know, the, the reader or, or the questionnaire, do they tell us what their filter is at all? No, they didn't, not on this one. Yeah, so, but you, you've got to get a way to, to trap and remove the bacteria cells that are growing or the cycle just repeats. So you can get small filter socks and a hanger. It hangs into the tank and you direct the outflow of your water pump, your filter through that filter sock. Get a couple of filter socks because it'll clog. 
they'll, they'll clog with the bacteria, which is what you want. You remove the filter sock and put a clean one in and then clean the filter sock you just removed and alternate with that. And that will be removing the bacteria, thereby removing the nutrients and clean up the system. But unless you've got some way to remove those bacteria, you're only doing half the job. Um, and I know we get, well, I've got a UV you know, sterilizer. Well, a UV sterilizer is just going to kill the bacteria. It's not removing the bacteria. And dead bacteria put the nutrients back in the water. You've got to break the cycle. So... And maybe if you don't really want a skimmer, maybe, maybe all the time, get one that you just run once in a while. When you have these blooms, when you treat, uh, turn the skimmer on for just a couple of days to remove all these bacteria because they're quite good at that. Yeah. And you know, there's a bunch, because it said it was a 20 gallon tank. So I know there's a bunch of skimmers, um, like, I guess, hang on back units sort of things. Uh, there's hang on back units. Yeah. Yeah. So like a little small one would be a good idea. Just yeah, just just temporarily. It's kind of like, you know, you don't always have the vacuum cleaner running at your house, unless you've got the <laughs> Zumba, I guess. Maybe they run all 24-7. But you just, you know, use it when you're cleaning your tank. But you've got to get the nutrients out of the out of the system somehow. Yep. All right. So good luck with that. Hopefully that helped to answer your question. All right. Next up. I'm constantly running into cyano issues and my nitrates are five. The phosphates are between 0 0.015 and 0 0.043. I've used ChemiClean twice and it keeps coming back. I believe it's an antibiotic killing some of the good bacteria and I want to solve the issue. Do you have any products that could maybe add good bacteria back into the tank or something to help fight the cyano? Wow, there's a lot in that question. The key word is antibiotics. <laughs> I told you that all these had like a lot of parts to them. <laughs> um, well, they don't tell what kind of antibiotic it is. And I think I've mentioned this before. There are two general groups, antibiotics that kill the bacteria right out. And it's probably not that because the cyanose grown. And then there's antibiotics that... Uh, inhibit the growth of the bacteria, but cyanobacteria are, are a little tougher than most because of that film that they grow. It's kind of a protective force field over the antibiotics and other types of things like that. Um, so the, my question would be, why are you treating for antibiotics? What's going on there? Are you trying to kill the cyano with antibiotics? Because that's not going to work very well unless you put a ton in there and then you're going to have ammonia problems and lots of other problems. So don't, I do not encourage the use of antibiotics to control cyano or any other problem. Um, unless you know your fish have a bacterial disease, you really shouldn't use antibiotics and it should be done in a quarantine tank. Uh, so how to get rid of this cyanide? Well, your nitrate is right on the edge. At five, it's a little low. It needs to be a little higher. Why? Because as I've said many times, we've got to get the water conditions to not favor the cyano and favor some competitors. So in this case, what I recommend is do a big siphon clean to get as much, physically remove as much as the cyano as you can. Uh, add our liquid waste away, which will get into the rocks and crevices and nooks and crannies and everything and degrade the organics that are in the system feeding the cyano. Um, and you know, start slowly, as we've been saying. Siphon clean, waste away. You've got to just, you've got a lot of nutrients in the system. There's no doubt about it. And if you're running a skimmer, consider turning the skimmer off at night to allow the uh, bacteria to remove the materials. And also you might want to, you got to get the nitrate up a little bit, feed a little bit higher, which seems counter, but you know, you, you need to get the nitrate up because when the nitrate's super low, that favors cyano because cyanobacteria can fix nitrogen from the atmosphere where bacteria and others can't. So 
you're favoring the sinos by having this low nitrate value. So you've got to get that up and, tr and make the environment less conducive to the sino. It takes time. The other thing to do is consider your lighting regime. A lot of people have these expensive, really, you know, really nice lights with lots of blue. And think about blue light. That's the light that penetrates the deepest in the ocean, it penetrates the deepest in water. And they, you know, you might be running your blue channel at 100%. Unless your tank is super tall, you, you know, over 24, 30 inches, 36 inches, you don't need to be re running the blue at that high of a, a, a number because you're just putting too much light in the water and too much light can favor the sino. So turn turn the uh, blue channel down to, for most shallow tanks, 50%, 45% is plenty of blue light for um, almost all the animals. You won't have a problem turning that down. Good to know. Yeah. Um, Sino's pretty much a, a condition of too much organic and uh, too little nutrients in the right form. And so increase that nitrate, phosphate was okay, and uh, do more house chores of keeping the water, of keeping the substrate clean. That's what needs to be done. All right, that's good. I'd be curious to know like what this person, what their substrate was like and what their lights were to see if those were the solutions. It's interesting because we, we go over all of these questions and these problems that people are having and you, you really hope that like they've listened to it and that they've heard and we've been able to help or you've been able to help fix their problems. No, you're part of this because, you know, and then think about what we've talked about. You know, you've got this team water and team substrate if you want to get into the vernacular. Um, with the sino being on the substrate. And as I said, because they're in a film, that film helps protect them against the antibiotic. Well, what we need is we need more bacteria in the water, but generally those are single cell bacteria and the antibiotic is going to affect them a lot more because they don't have the protection. So using the antibiotic is kind of turning the tank in favor of the sino by preventing the bacteria, the beneficial bacteria that we need from growing in the water. So, it, it, you know, unless you really know that you need antibiotics, adding antibiotics, especially to a reef tank, is just going to cause you lots of problems because bacteria in the corals, the symbiotic bacteria, the uh, the bacteria in the water, all these are good guys that we need to have a complete system. And the antibiotics are indiscriminate. They don't care and they don't distinguish between the good bacteria and the bad bacteria. It always makes me nervous, like treating tanks. Me too. <laughs> a lot of times you just, you think it's this, but it's parasites or it's just something else if you really really want to treat your tank with an antibiotic in most cases the best way is to be feeding the fish yes. and and make your own medicated food which is which is easy to do with our beneficial um do-it-yourself fish food um you can add the antibiotic right into the food the fish are used to eating that um and now they're getting it inside them, you know, and, and that's what they need in, in many cases. It's going to um, help to have the bacteria, the antibiotic inside the fish rather than just in the water where it can cause all sorts of uh, unintended consequences, none of which are usually very good. No, actually, I, I was making some medicated food this morning, believe it or not, as uh, my, my cowfish has some... I think it's an infection. He's had it before, but uh, it's starting to get better and I've got to go away for a day. So I'm having somebody to take care of the tank. And instead of like teaching them to feed him the food with a, like the medicated food with a spoon, I'm like, I'm just going to mix it up in the beneficial fish food and give them a cube and tell them to feed him this. It's like a thousand times easier. Yes. And people can count one, two, three. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> What's a pinch? Your pinch is maybe not as 
big as my pinch. So, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and my cowfish too. Everybody that comes over, they're like, oh, he's hungry. I need to feed him. I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> it's not called a cowfish for nothing. Maybe he should be a pigfish. You know, that's, that's an interesting point. He could be. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Got distracted. Get back on track. It's so nice. next question is about a fishless cycle in a five gallon tank. I added a two ounce bottle of the nitrifying bacteria and dosed ammonium 24 hours ago. My ammonia is still high, but I'm registering a good amount of nitrites. Should I wait another day and test ammonia? I was expecting that to drop when I checked that day. Uh, okay, so it it takes more than 24 hours to get this whole thing going. The bacteria have to attach and start working, but you know they're starting to do things by the nitrite. So in this case, I would probably wait another 24 hours before doing anything you know the bacteria are working, just give them a little bit more time, check the next day, and then dose accordingly. What do I mean by that? As we say many times, you don't want your ammonia or your nitrite to get too high. So you can add half the drops. A five-gallon tank, you got some substrate in there, some rocks, some decorations, maybe only three and a half you know, gallons, four gallons, it's not a lot of water. Um, you're not going to put a lot of fish in there anyways. And the dosing instructions with the fishless cycling are for when you have a lot of fish in a, a tank. So cut it in half. There's no wrong way to, to add that ammonia. You don't need to add the fully recommended dose. You can cut it in half or a quarter. But in this case, I would have, I would wait 24 hours and then a measure and then add a few drops, maybe half the drops of ammonia. All right, good. And it, there was a saltwater tank, right? Um, Does it say? I, it doesn't say. Okay, so so because here's another thing you have to be careful of is we've talked about buffering. So the conversion of ammonia to nitrite, nitrite to nitrate is releasing hydrogen ion, so it's, it's causing the alkalinity to be consumed, whether it's fresh water or salt water. But if you have poorly buffered water, you could find that the pH is going to drop. And so, especially if you have a fresh water tank, I would measure pH while you're doing this cycling, because if the pH gets below seven, the bacteria are going to slow. They're not dying, they're just slowing because the ammonia is in the wrong form. It's in the ammonium form. So you might have to do some water changes or buff your water, especially if you're in certain areas of Florida, upstate New York, the Pacific Northwest, all has low alkalinity water. So when you're fishless cycling and adding the drops, you're adding a fair amount of ammonia, which is going to consume that alkalinity. Your pH can drop quite fast. So you need to, to measure that. Yep. And something that I want to mention too, that we've talked about in the past is, you know, you don't have to add the full amount of drops. I feel like that's something that I see people writing in a lot of times, like, do I really have to add the full amount? No, no, you don't. No, the full amount is assuming, you know, you've got a, a cichlid tank and you want to add all the fish at once, or you've got a bunch of fish and, you know, for your saltwater tank in quarantine, and you're going to add a, a pretty full load, uh, all at once. So you can always dial it, dial it back, especially, you know, you see this with people that are doing bedded tanks and things like that. It's going to be one fish. Um, you can cut the ammonia way back um, just because you're only going to be developing a biofilter for a single fish, not for a bunch of fish. So. Right. Question number six. I'm adding first defense into my water. And as I'm doing so, I've noticed white particles similar to when milk goes bad. I've never seen this before, but is it possible that I've just never noticed it? Is this okay to use? Uh, it's fine to use. Um, white particles, depending on the age of the first defense, maybe a little uh, something pre precipitated out into uh, or along the edge of the, the lip of the bottle or the, the neck of the bottle. And then when you added it, it came out, but uh, perfectly fine. There's nothing hazardous in first defense and it will uh, probably dissolve in the tank over time. So not a problem. All right. That's good. 
This next one makes me really happy because it addresses the both of us. It's always exciting to hear that, like, I don't know, it's, it's kind of like talking to somebody firsthand. So Coral Reef Talk, hi, thank you so much for listening. Um, they want to reach out and say hi, hope all is well. I'm interested in your new line of test kits. Yay, we're very excited. They're awesome test kits. Um, so here's the thing. I just picked up a bottle of Waste Away to help get rid of dinos. My question is, how necessary is the three-day blackout, and can I just lower my light intensity? Well, it depends on your uh, resistance <laughs> to how much work you want to do. Uh, the reason for the three-day blackout is that the dinoflagellates are photosynthetic in almost all cases. And what we're trying to do is change the environment to not favor them. And when there's no light, they're not growing. And after a time, they get stressed. And when they're stressed, they're more susceptible to the treatments like the refresh. Do you absolutely positively have to do the um, blackout? The answer is no. Are you decreasing your chances of success with one treatment? The answer is yes. So, uh, you know, ha, ha, the, if your tank, because the next question is, okay, if I can dim my lights, how dim? But that depends on the depth of the tank because it's not your eye that is measuring the light. It's the blue part that's coming you know, through the water. So I would definitely turn down the blue to zero and uh, see how that is. But I think it's just easier because if you've got any ambient light in the room, the dinoflagellates, they don't need tons of light. You're, you're not filtering, you know, this light through 20, 30, 40 feet of water. It's two, three feet and the water's moving. Uh, and especially if, you know, the, it goes right through the glass, right on that uh, contact in the glass or into the substrate because the light isn't coming straight down. It's coming from the sides because it's just not the light on your tank. It's the light in the room. It's the reflective light from the walls and things like that. So uh, it's kind of up to you, but you're uh, decreasing your chances of success by not using the blackout. All right, that was good. You know, it's interesting that I, I was talking to an old friend that I hadn't talked to in a while. And she was like, yeah, I set up a tank for my daughter and she'd never cared for fish tanks before in her life. And because she's like, oh, it'll be really pretty to have it like right next to the window. And she was having all sorts of algae issues because of the location. She's like, I moved it. You'd be proud. I was like, I am proud. Good job. <laughs> yes. Now, long-term though, cause you know, we, we want to treat with the refresh, the waste away, want everything to be great. You know, we're, we just want answers and I do A and B and I get everything back to normal. And that's not the case if the water quality, again, if the environment is favoring dinoflagellates, that's what you're going to get. I preach this a lot. So if you have basically no phosphate and your nitrate is low, you know, below five down there. Some people have zero nitrate because they've read somewhere, get zero nitrate and zero phosphate. No matter what you do, the blackout, our treatment, brand A, B, C, and D's treatment, you're not going to have much success because that environment doesn't favor the growth of anything but dinoflagellates. You don't have enough nutrients to grow bacteria that, from the waste away because they need the nitrate and phosphate to degrade the organics and to fight the dinos, but your tank doesn't have any of that. So long-term, you need to turn that skimmer off because uh, that you probably got a big one in there because bigger is better. Um, Maybe you've got a refugium. I mean, Hillary, you see this. People have a list and they've put ev everything to, you know, just everything, skimmers and refugias and UVs and this and that. And it's too much. You're making the water too pure, which favors organisms you generally don't want. 
and yeah. nitrate and phosphate being zero or super low favors dyno a hundred out of a hundred times. And <laughs> until, until you get that, it, until you change the parameters, you're just going to get dynos and it's going to be super frustrating. And you're going to write us not so nice emails about how the products aren't working, but our products can't work in an environment that don't favor the bacteria. You know, we're trying to switch the game from the dyno to the pelagic bacteria that can help you and cleanse things, but you've got to give them nutrients to grow. So um, you need to be aware of that. Yes, I like that. I like that quote. Our products don't work in an environment that doesn't favor the bacteria. Mm -hmm. That's so important. It's going to yeah. be a post. That's it. going to be a post. Okay. <laughs> treat All your right. bacteria good. Exactly. And, and they'll treat you well. Exactly. There's it another like, post. <laughs> right. It could be like a fun comic or a cartoon or something. I could see it. Okay. All right. Um, so I threw up this sticker on our Instagram stories and asked people if they had any questions. So I'm going to throw two of those in right now. The first question is, I've been dealing with tissue recession on euphilia. What should I do? Are there any products that you make that could help? Well, I mean, we, we need to know what it is. If it's parasitic, mm. That's, you know, because, you, you know, things come out at night when you're not watching the tank uh, and it can be very small. So parasitic is going to be tough. I would say we don't really make anything. The refresh can help. Um, if it's bacterial, uh, maybe the waste away or, or the eco balance, because eco balance is a probiotic against Vibrio. So a lot of times the tissue recession is due to Vibrio, but Vibrio is the kind of what we call the secondary bacterial infection. It's the opportunistic. Something's happened to damage that tissue a little bit. And now the Vibrio has a chance to start working. So the equal balance could um, help. But again, it's very hard to know specifically um, what it is. So you, you've, you're kind of have to try both and see see what happens but refresh for possible parasites and uh, bacteria and equal balance for vibrio type bacteria right cool the next question that we have that came from instagram is what is the best way to get rid of slime type algae slime type algae is that cyano uh well well I mean, we've we've said it several times during this cast. Uh, one, measure your water quality and figure out where you are. If you've got high phosphate and uh, low nitrate, well, you're favoring the cyano because the cyano can fix nitrogen. So you've got to change the water quality. Um, are you cleaning? Or not cleaning very often? So there's a lot of organics building up in the substrate where the slime bacteria are growing or in the live rock. You need to add water flow to try to keep those organics suspended so that you can remove them with your mechanical filter. Uh, and then of course, you know, the refresh and the waste away, but the refresh and waste away, yes, I wanna of course sell you this stuff, it's our business, but overall you, you need to look at what the underlying causes of the slime bacteria are. And we've talked about several of them. It's generally your water quality or a buildup of organics uh, or poor husbandry or you know the tank is overstocked, overfed, and you're not removing enough of that, those nutrients and that waste that becomes nutrients for the slime bacteria. They're there for a reason. Um, are you over skimming? You know, we've said that a lot where you're just, running that skimmer 24 seven, removing all the bacteria from the water and the slime bacteria have, have the whole field to themselves. So I think I said about four or five different things, maybe more that need to be done. Yep. So hopefully if you're listening to this, it gives you a bunch of different suggestions and things to look for and try to fix. Yep. All right. This is another one of these uh, multi-part, rather long question. Oh, I feel like I have to have a notepad next to me to remember. 
sorry, this one is about ammonia dosing. I started with a full dose and then did half a dose per the instructions, but I realized too late that I had the wrong test kit and it was showing zero ammonia. Because of this, I added another full ammonia dose to the tank. I haven't added ammonia for a week and it's been zero for about four days. My nitrite is above one, the max that my red seed kit shows, and my nitrate is above 50, the max that it shows. Should I just carry on waiting, I'm in no rush, or does that sound like it's stalled and I should add another bottle? Well, kind of flying a little blind here because all we know is nitrate is high. And I would say that the nitrate is really high because as I mentioned before, nitrite really high, because as I've mentioned before, the nitrate test kit measures both nitrite and nitrate. And if your nitrate is above 50, there's probably a bunch of nitrite in that reading. So what, what do you do? You have a test kit, it, you know, the nitrite, it only goes to one. Well, do dilutions. So take, you know, uh, an ounce of your water from your aquarium and put it in a clean glass or cup or something like that. And add, start with three ounces, add three ounces of drinking water, you know, of, of a bottled water, not your tap water, because your tap water can have nitrate in it, but just your drinking water. So now you've diluted that three to one, stir it real well and run a test. If you get a reading, say, say you get a reading, it's 0.5. Okay, well, you've diluted it by four three plus one. So you take that 0. 0.5, you dilute it, you times it by four and your reading is two. Say though that the reading is off the scale. Well, add six more ounces to bring it to 10 ounces. So now you've got one ounce from your aquarium water, nine ounces of drinking water for a total of 10, stir it real well and do another test. And if the test comes out again to 0.5, or then that tells you it's 0.5 times 10, your nitrate is five. And that's, you know, it's going to be stalling when it gets that high. So these serial dilutions you're doing, you can still use your test, just dilute the water till you get the, uh, the test kit to read within the range of the test. And you're just looking for an indication. The, the red sea kits are, are, are okay. And you can tell 0.5 from one or zero. And that gives you an idea. And that tells you that most of that uh, nitrate was in the form of nitrite. And that's why you're getting these huge readings because to make things even comp more complicated, they're measuring in the ionic form. So there's some math there and that's more of a, I almost have to have a whiteboard to go through that. Um, but we've talked about that and there's a chart on our website about the conversion of those units. Um, but now that you've done the dilution, you know your, your nitrite is super high, you really need to consider whether doing a water change um, is the way to go because that will speed up the cycle. You don't necessarily need to add more bacteria. You need to reduce the amount of nitrate a nitrite in the water because uh, it's inhibiting the growth of the bacteria. Now I'm going to chime in here and say something that I left out, but it's also in the notes for this question is that they had already done a water change and those values of one and 50 were after the water change. Well, that kind of makes sense because, you know, the person they added the wrong ammonia or had the wrong test. So they're dumping ammonia in there which we say not to do because they're really not, because you're kind of flying blind. The ammonia oxidizing bacteria work much faster than the nitrite. And so generally you'll find no ammonia. You'll think, great, I'll feed them some more because they're going to starve to death. They're not going to starve to death. They don't need to be fed three times a day, two times a day. They don't need to be fed every day. They're not human. Um, 
and the, they work, but they're converting that to nitrite. As the nitrite builds up super high, there's a negative feedback. So the nitrite bacteria slow down, but the ammonia bacteria are fine. So you keep on dumping more ammonia in there, which is, I think, kind of what this reader or this questionnaire was doing. You know, I'm dumping ammonia, then something was wrong, but I put some more ammonia in. Don't know really where I am, but I'm going to put some more ammonia in. And assuming, because this is another thing, and I've got a video on this, um, if just because you get a clear ammonia test doesn't necessarily mean your ammonia is zero. If you add that last reagent and the water in the test tube gets kind of a milky white, a, a whitish color, that's actually an indication that the ammonia is probably super high and there's not enough of the reagent to make the color change. The fix for that, especially, you know, think about what you've been doing. I've been adding a lot of ammonia, kind of getting a strange reading here. Um, but if it's whitish, milky colored, you need to do the dilution I just talked about, you know, one ounce and one ounce or one in three is always a nice number because you just multiply it by four um, or one in four ounces, you multiply it by five dilute it and run the ammonia test again. And chances are you'll find that you have ammonia. It's just so high that your test kit can't measure it. So that's, that can be a problem with all test kits. If the target ammonia nitrite nitrate is especially ammonia, if it's super high, the test kit's not gonna measure it. It's just gonna go to a milky white color not the, usually it's the greenish blue color, clear. You want the liquid to be clear. Yep. All right, so hopefully whoever's issue that is, hopefully that helps and uh, you get your tank onwards of cycling. Yep. We got another cycling question on a 60 liter freshwater tank. They're using our one and only and the ammonia and says I'm on day three, which suggests I should add ammonia, but readings yesterday and today have both been pH of 7.4, ammonia is two, nitrite is 0.25, nitrate is 10. I'm on day three. Should I measure again tomorrow and observe a decrease in ammonia before bringing it back up to two? Hmm. Well, uh, we, when we, and we talk about this, bringing it back up to two, that always scares me because it see, it kind of implies that you're going to add ammonia drops until that ammonia test kit says it's at two. That is not the way to proceed. I specifically talk about this, write this. No, don't just keep on adding ammonia. Never go over four drops per gallon, one drop per liter. That's the most ammonia that you should be adding at any time to your tank. And you may not read to. It's not a big deal. Don't worry about the numbers. Think about the process. I've added the ammonia. I've added this amount. And the question is, should I add more? And don't be in a rush to add more. You can always wait another day. Um, Nothing, nothing bad happens by waiting, you know, another day to cycle your tank. Uh, it gives the bacteria a chance and, you know, to stabilize, to grow. They're not going to starve. They're doing quite well. In this case, I would probably do a half a dose. Again, as we said earlier, you don't have to add a full dose. You can add one drop per gallon, a quarter dose, um, you know, and, and do that. But definitely don't bring it back up to two by just dumping ammonia uh, in the tank until you get that test kit to read two. That's going to just cause lots of problems. Okay. Here is our question from the UK. I've been using your ammonia chloride and one and only bacteria. I notice it says in the instructions to remove filter socks for the first 48 hours, but I don't 
have those. I've got a canister filter with foam filter pads. Should I remove these or can they stay? They can stay. Filter pads, wool pads, fiber stuffed in a corner filter, the blue fuzzy pads on an overflow, sponges, all that stuff is porous enough and that substrate the bacteria will grow on. What I'm specifically talking about is those fine 200, 400, 600 micron filter socks. Generally, they are in sump systems where the water in the, from the first chamber into the second chamber uh, flows into a filter sock or sometimes the uh, drain tube goes right into the filter sock. Um, those fine filters you want to take out for 48 hours, everything else you want to leave in. And I'm sure you've seen this, Hillary. It, it kind of boggles the mind. You want your filter running. We get so many emails where I've, I've followed your direction and I've left my filter off for the first 48 hours. What? We don't say that. We, <laughs> we, I All right. No, I, I I mean, that. Yeah, uh, but... I, I know you, we're not laughing at anybody, but it's like you need the water running. You need the water movement. You need to get to carry the bacteria, you know, into different parts so they can colonize all the filter and stuff. So we never say turn your filter off. The, the skimmer, yes, but that's not a filter. The UV sterilizer, yes, but again, that's not your filter. You need the water moving. You need the pump running, whether it's the canister or the hang on the tank or the inside of the tank sponge filter, get those running, get the heater on, have water circulation. You need that to get your cycle going. Yep, that's true. All right, let's see. Um, there's another question. Do I need to add more ammonia? Will the bacteria be okay? Or are they going to need to eat? I think you've answered that one already. <laughs> yes. Um, Yep. Here, this, this, this question is a little bit more technical than some of the other ones. Um, I'm confused by the units. Is PPM the same as milligrams per liter? Well, it, it means super technically, no. But are we going to get into that? Again, no. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's not really for practical purposes purposes, the answer is yes. Um, they're, they're basically the same. So milligrams per liter, parts per million, yep. For all practical purposes in the aquarium environment, they're the same. Yep. All right. Good to know. Yeah. The, 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 the issue, you, you didn't think I was going to leave that easy. <laughs> <laughs> the, the issue is, as I've said before, is what is your kit actually what units is it measuring in do you have a kit and the example i always use is two tape measures one tape measure measures in centimeters another tape measure measures in inches so you take and you measure a, a, a piece of wood and it's 12 inches long one foot 12 inches and you say 12 yeah i got 12 and then somebody else takes their measure and they're from Europe and they go, no, it's 25. And now you start arguing, well, 12, you know, I got 12, you got 25. Why is yours, you know, two and a half, actually it's going to be 30. It's going to be 30. And so they've got 30, you've got 12, you're arguing. But the answer is actually the same because you measured in inches and they measured in centimeters and 12 inches equals 30 centimeters, but it's the units. And that's what I get into with these test kits is many test kits aren't clear of what their unit is. Are they measuring in the ion NH3 or NH4? Or are they measuring in the nitrogen scale? So it'll say ammonia nitrogen or nitrite nitrogen. And, th and that's where the confusion can, can happen. All our values, when I say don't go over five milligrams per liter nitrite nitrogen. If your test kit is measuring in ion units, I think you have to multiply that by like 3.7. So it's going to be 15. It's just a different units of measurement depending on the kit you're using. 
And unfortunately, many test kit manufacturers aren't clear on what units their test measures. Uh, we've got a, a plot in the fishless cycling section on our website. There's a section on these um, test kits and the units. That's what you need to be more concerned about rather than uh, whether it measures PPM or milligrams per liter. I always thought that was really frustrating, especially for beginners and people that are brand new and you look at different test kits and you're like, I don't understand, what's the difference? Yeah, and, and manufacturers, I'll, you know, give a collective guilty uh, plea to that. They're, they're just not clear. Maybe they don't understand. I mean, there's, there's scientific literature on ammonia testing, you know, which I, I did my master's thesis on ammonia toxicity in, in fish and ammonia excretion. And you read these papers and the units aren't right. Um, so it's, it's, it's a big problem um, that, that just makes for a lot of confusion. Yep. All right. How are we doing on time? Do we have time for more questions? We got about time for about one more. All right. One more question. Okay. Let's see. Here is one that I think came through on the info email. I was wondering about concentrations of bacteria in our tanks, primarily the nitrifying bacteria. So my question is, what is the concentration of bacteria in the water column as opposed to on the surfaces? I don't need exact numbers, even a ratio would work. From what I've gathered in wastewater plants, there seems to be quite a bit in the water column itself, which leads me to believe that using a UV sterilizer in a tank is more detrimental due to decreasing the bacterial load. Okay, and that's, this would be a good last question. It's got lots of answers. So first, in a sewage treatment plant, most treatment plants use what's called activated sludge. So if you looked at the water, you surely aren't going to jump in it because it's not crystal clear. It's bubbling and it's brown and there's all this gunk in it. Well, the nitrifiers are stuck to that gunk or this sludge, which is activated because it's activated with the bacteria. Now contrast that with your aquarium. Nobody has an aquarium with a bunch of sludge, you know, twirling and tumbling through the water. On the contrary, we want our water to be crystal clear. So there's not much that a sewage plant has in common with your aquarium. The ammonia nitrite values are much higher. The environment is much different. For your aquarium, the nitrifying bacteria, because they want to be on a surface, they are on surfaces. I showed this years ago when I filtered tons of water, many, many, many different aquariums, and I couldn't detect with the molecular probes any nitrifying bacteria in the water. And also lately, some of the people doing the binomic studies show that there's basically no nitrifiers in the water. So when we're talking about nitrifying bacteria, they are definitely on surfaces. That's where they want to grow. And so there's, there's very little, sure, there's some, but very little in the water. When it comes to the heterotrophs, the bacteria that consume nitrate and phosphate, they are definitely in the water. But then again, the devices that we use, the skimmer, removes them. Uh, Sanjay did a study, it's been several years, but he used flow cytometry to show that once you turn the skimmer on, the bacterial count in the water column drops drastically because the skimmer is basically, the bacteria stick to those bubbles and they're skimmed out. <clears throat> Excuse me, that's why I always talk about turning your skimmer off. Don't over skim because we want the bacteria in the water column, but we're doing all these things unintentionally to remove them. So the heterotrophs, what we'd like is more heterotrophs in the water and nitrifiers on the surface. And uh, we're not pretty much at all like what a sewage treatment plant is. Um, there are in aquaculture facilities, uh, different types of filters, where you're trying to keep the bio media, it's called fluidized bed. A fluidized bed, there's, there's a couple companies that have tried to do fluidized bed filtration for aquariums. So what's a fluidized bed? Kind of think of the bead filter 
except the beads aren't biodegradable. They're inert. And you grow the nitrifiers on the beads because they want to be on a surface, but you're tumbling them through the water. So you're bringing the water in contact with the nitrifiers growing on a surface. And a bead filter can be a very efficient filter. Why? Because the nitrifiers aren't being smothered by grunge and dirt and heterotrophs. Because think about a static better a filter like a like an undergravel filter or even uh, you know a trickle bed filter uh, the water trickles down through the media the nitrifiers start growing on the media but if you don't keep the media clean it starts being smothered with organic material and once the organics uh, accumulate over the biomedia Oxygen can't get to the nitrifiers and they can't do their job. So bead filter, because the bacteria are, are on a bead that's always tumbling, the beads are kept quite clean. Nitrifiers can stick really well because they form that you know, EPS, the, the polymer substance. So it keeps them really clean and it's a great filter. It's just the applicate or the application i guess of, of the bead has always just been a little bit more difficult than people can handle it's kind of like denitrifying filters they're a little finicky the you know the beads get flushed into the tank but uh you can understand the difference the filter media the nitrifiers are growing on is kept much cleaner but it's still they're on the media they're not in the water so nitrifiers, they're not in your water system. That's why I say moving a tank and taking your water with you is just moving a lot of weight. You want a clean substrate to your new tank. Moving, uh, it's a lot of water. <laughs> Thinking about <laughs> moving water in time, I'm like, oh boy. Yeah, not, not really necessary. Yeah. All right, well, we have uh, some good questions this time. Yes, lots of neat stuff. Uh, always great to talk to uh, to you, Hillary, of course, and talk about these things and answer people's questions. And have all, as always, if you have questions, if this has just raised more questions, <laughs> please, you know, it's confusing. Just uh, please tell us. You know, I didn't understand that. Info at drtimsaquatics.com. And we will definitely get you on the next question and answer podcast. Yep. And for the people, I think there was two questions that I've got that we didn't get to. We will get to you next month. Promise. We can do them real fast if they're short, Hillary. They're not. <laughs> they're not. They're long ones. Okay. All the ones today are really long. <laughs> long. All right. Eh, we're going to have to wait on those two. Yep. So. so, all right. Well, thank you everyone for listening. I, I don't know when we're doing the next recording. Is there any? No, there's no trade shows between now and the next one. So. Yeah. yeah a couple of weeks. We'll get it done. Yeah. So, all right. Thanks everyone. Thanks for listening to our 20th. Wow podcast and join us. It's much appreciated. Yes. Right.